Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. And this show is the state of the state of Hawaii. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. This show reports on key local and national events and issues that impact our state. And uh, we invite guests who have expertise and informed viewpoints on, on these topics and their impact on the state. The show's coverage uh, includes small business issues, the economy of the state government, politics, law, public health policy, safety, transportation, education, and, and many others. Uh, viewers' topics and suggestions or recommendations are, are very welcome and can be sent to the program's website at thinktechhawaii.com. Today's show uh, focuses on Hawaii's economy, um, under or now in the wake, hopefully, of COVID-19 as fiscal relief comes to the islands in the latest Corona Aid Relief Economic Security Act, Act or the CARES Act. And uh, what is this relief and, and how will it impact Hawaii? Is it enough to revive state and city county budgets? In other words, will it be in um, Hawaii's Goldilocks zone and make everything just right again or close to it. So today my guest is um, Associate Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where he's the director of the Public Policy Center. Dr. Moore's expertise is, is in public policy and governing, including um, close study of Hawaii and publications relating to its circumstances. And he can enlighten us on how the state, city, and county benefits from this relief. So welcome, Professor Colin Moore. Thanks, great to be here, uh, Stephanie. Mahalo for joining us today. Um, what we're here is to talk about this relief pack, this relief act. Um, and if this is the best news Hawaii said, and is it in what I'm referring to as the, the Hawaii's Goldilocks zone? And um, that is, is it just right for us? Um, what does it look like to you? Sure. Well, maybe I can just describe it a little bit. It is certainly great news because whether it's enough, um, we can talk about, but without this, the state of Hawaii would be in desperate straits. I mean, we would be furloughing public sector workers, slashing school budgets. I mean, this state has been, is among the hardest hit of the COVID pandemic because our economy is so closely connected to tourism and industry that um, basically collapsed during this period. And we have one of the highest rates of unemployment in the country. And all of that, of course, takes a huge hit to the state budget. So. Um, the, the expectation is that Hawaii is going to get $6 billion um, from this package, which is an enormous amount of money. Um, now, not all of it's going to go directly to the state. So about $2.2 billion of that is going to go to state and county government. So maybe I can just break this out a little bit. So um, the counties are going to get big chunks of money, and that's very important. So it'll, it'll go all the way from Kauai, which gets 13 million to Honolulu, which will get 365 million. Um, unemployment assistance is a big chunk of this to shore up our unemployment fund. Um, and that of course is connected um, to the expansion of unemployment benefits. That's about 575 million. Um, a big chunk of this is for rental and mortgage relief. That's about 250 million. Um, and so this will We've had a rental um, assistance program. This helps keep people in their units and helps keep landlords um, being paid, which in Hawaii actually is very important because not only do we have tremendously high costs of, of housing here, we don't have a lot of corporate landlords. And so a lot of our local landlords are sort of mom and pop landlords who own a few properties and really have had a tough time weathering this because of course, you know, they don't have huge corporate reserve funds to continue to pay their mortgages. So that's gonna help. Um, 150 million will go to various um, healthcare systems. Some of this will be um, a slight um, reduction in the price you'd pay for healthcare. They're covering uh, COBRA if you've lost your job during this period. Um, then um, I think any parent would be happy to hear that Hawaii schools are getting a lot of money. Um, so 
there's 634 million going to schools that and that I mean it's mainly DOE schools. And Stephanie, before we started, we were talking about how much money would go to UH. And um, I just found the number um, right before we got on. It's actually 158 million. Um, and that would that goes to support the whole UH system. So all 10 campuses of the University of Hawaii system, including the flagship Manoa campus. And this, I mean, as someone who is employed by the University of Hawaii, that is a great relief to me personally. But I mean, this is a sort of time where students who are not employed can come back to school and, and universities need those resources to keep offering classes um, and providing um, tuition and support for those students. Um, the last few chunks are um, about 80 million going to native Hawaiian programs that's split between healthcare and education and then some money for small businesses, vaccine distribution. And then finally, the last big chunk is the 1.7 billion that'll be distributed in those $1,400 stimulus checks to Hawaii residents. Okay. And um, yeah, that, that makes up, um, what are they, about 17% of the total, the stimulus uh, right. checks? I think they are, yeah. And um, does this mean, uh, I, I'm glad you clarified the dire straits that this state is in. Um, I think, you know, it, certainly that's been publicized, but I mean, it, it's really been tough on a lot of people. So these questions about, is this enough or are sincere? And um, is, is, uh, is the county, city county gonna get a, a decent allotment? I know you said there, there's allotment for the state and also for the city county. Is that gonna be enough to get us back to par on the budget? Or are we staring down tax, tax think, increases, you think? I think it depends on how quickly our economy recovers. I think it's enough to fill some holes right now. And, and it's more than enough for that. I mean, this, is, um, this will provide many for, um, for other projects. I mean, but I think the question is, can our economy recover in time to be back on track when the stimulus runs out? I think that's the big question. Um, in my mind, because I don't think we're going to get another big stimulus. I mean, this is a huge amount of money, but this is probably all we're going to get. I mean, and certainly in terms of money that would go directly to cover um, public sector budgets. Um, and so Hawaii, this is, you know, this could be a little dicey because our, we had a huge decline in our GDP. Obviously that affects tax revenue. And, um, and we've, this will help us be okay probably for the next year or so. Um, but the question is, is tourism going to come back? If that doesn't happen, um, then we're going to continue to have these problems um, paying for our public sector, paying for our schools. And I know not everyone likes tourism. And I think, you know, part of this, maybe on a different program, we can talk about how to reinvent tourism in Hawaii. But the truth of the matter is, that's still the biggest part of our economy, um, and certainly the one that has declined the most during this pandemic. So we had about 500,000 visitors in 2020. That's about a fifth of the, of the number in the same period in 2019. So we are way, 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 way down. Um, and people are coming back, but I think it depends on the speed they return. And the real unknown question is how this will affect international travel. So I think a lot of economists, and I agree with them, expect that um, tourism will rebound from the U.S. mainland relatively quickly, but the international tourists, particularly those from Japan, who spend much more money per tourist than mainland tourists, I don't think that's going to come back anytime soon, probably not within the next year or so. Um, so well, that's a long that? answer to your question, but it, it, it's no, enough but right now, but it may not be enough in the future. Uh, okay, because they'll be seeking for further afield uh, destinations uh, and rather than just Hawaii. Well, um, I think it's probably just because they won't be able to leave. They won't be able to travel internationally. Oh, because of their count, their country's uh, rules. Right, right, or our country's uh, rules. Or our country rules. Okay. Well, you know, I uh, the, these are such good, important points and very informative, and, and given that eleven percent. And, and given the point that this is it, for undoubtedly, this is it for handouts, if we want to call it that, for relief. Um, but 11% of the act is dedicated to, to the relief checks, which is a, a nice p 
piece. And certainly citizens will benefit from having that additional um, funding. But now, is, is that at the level of really helping them? And especially given we're not gonna have this happen again. So, and if the economy doesn't rebound. So what, what do you think about that 11% and those relief checks? What do, do you think is gonna to happen to those in the hands of, of the citizens? Are they gonna save them? Are they gonna pay their rent? What, what are the circumstances you think out there? Well, I think that, um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you, you have to remember it'll be, of course, the $1,400 is also in addition, I mean, that's on top of, for people who are unemployed, the expanded and augmented unemployment benefits. So, I mean, one of the odd things we saw during COVID because of these relief packages is that poverty actually declined in the United States, um, which is an unusual thing to have, have happened. Um, but because people were benefiting from augmented employment and the stimulus checks, um, they uh, that that actually took some very poor people and brought them up a little bit. Now that's obviously not sustainable. Um, that won't last beyond these stimulus packages. But um, I, it it has had a huge difference. I think the the I mean made a huge difference. I think the fear is that what happens when this ends, and we still have a relatively high unemployment rate because it's going to end. Um, the other, the other thing that's going to help a lot, um, that has gotten some attention, but I want to make sure I emphasize here is the, the change in the child tax credit. Um, and this may become something that's permanent. So there's a, a one year boost in the child tax credit, which would provide, um, 3,600 3, for, um, parents with children, each child under six, 3,000 for each child under 18. And that is a huge amount of money because unlike the way this was previously structured, not only is it more money, but um, all of the money, these are refundable tax credits, which means that even if you don't pay any money in income taxes, you're still going to get the, the credit in, in the form of a check from the government for um, to support your children. And so that is another huge boost um, to um, the, the family budgets of, of poor folks or even middle class folks because this extends up relatively high. So I, I think that's that's very interesting and it does relate to um, some cri criticism I wanted to bring up of this relief package and that was from um, Larry Summers who's an economist, a Harvard uh, professor. Um, and he was very critical of this unemployment insurance boost because he sees that that is the kind of thing that that maybe characterizes a lot of the payments of the funding in the in the act, which is it's well more than is needed, and that most of the uh, payments out of unemployment insurance have been above it, the, the levels of earnings before this whole catastrophe began, and that he doesn't see it as enough of an incentive to get back to work, and he doesn't see that as the best way to target the money. What do you think about that criticism? Yeah, I mean, there are some valid points there. I mean, I think one of the, the most valid points is that is, is why are you giving extra money to people who didn't lose their job? Why are we sending $1,400 checks to people who are not unemployed, who, who haven't really um, seen any adverse economic uh, effects of this crisis? Um, you know, I think there's probably something to be said for that, but I think that this has touched all families in a variety of ways from parents with children who had to figure out ways to cover their kids child care during this so i'm i understand that point it, it doesn't worry me a whole lot i think the one one part of this that i don't think is valid is this concern that if you um, increase unemployment people won't go back to work there there isn't any evidence that that's really true um, you know that people have been returning to work when their jobs are available because people are smart they know this isn't going to last forever, and they know that if they have an opportunity to return to work, uh, they should probably take that. So, although that that's kind of theoretically could be true, I haven't seen any strong evidence. I mean, maybe with some people. I mean, there's always, um, you know, the individual um, cases are always distinct, but overall, I don't think that's been a problem. Um, you know, and it's the 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 real critique Summers and others have, along with this, of course, is that this is gonna overheat the economy, that it's way more money than you need. This is all financed by debt, $1.9 trillion is an enormous amount of money. Um, that's gonna to lead to inflation um, and a lot of other bad consequences. And I think that's really the debate. That's the real, that, that is the potential danger here. Um, I just tend to think that the costs of not doing something far outweigh the potential risks of having some inflation.
Yeah. Well, Larry Summers, yes, did mention that. I wanted to say that he did praise the child care, uh, the, 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 the child care um, credit that he's giving and the tax, the tax credit. And he sees that as something that's a, a matter of changing public uh, social policy that we're doing something about relieving child poverty. And he saw that as highly praiseworthy. And I guess that's about the only thing he saw as praiseworthy in the bill because he mentioned the unemployment insurance and also this issue of inflation and that not enough was done to target these payments, to target this money to destinations that will strengthen of the economy and the capacity of people to to manage um, you know their resources better and and to prepare to de, de, defer this inflation going forward so he seemed to have a pretty um, um, negative take on the the long-term value of this it's kind of a sh more of a short-term fix and he doesn't see that this a massive large-scale effort should have been given um, made into just mostly a short-term fix. Do you do you see it as a short-term fix too? Or well, what about it, it, his point about the long term? It, it's part, I mean, obviously it's, yeah, sure. It's partly a short-term fix. Um, I think that, um, I mean, other economists would say that the risk of not doing enough is far greater than the risk of doing a little too much and providing a little too much money. And I think that was the lesson a lot of these economists took from the Great Recession, that not enough was done, there wasn't enough investment. And of course, Larry Summers was an architect of that. Um, you know, he's an esteemed economist, although he takes a more conservative uh, position on this. I think that, um, you know, that the argument that this should have been more targeted, I think that in a crisis situation like this, that it takes a long time to do that. I mean, you need to start programs. It, it's an implementation uh, challenge to, to figure out how to target that money to specific industries you'd want to invest in. Um, and so I don't think he's wrong. I think that over the long term, that is what we want to see. But I think in this emergency situation, just giving people money um, uh, is, is pretty effective. Um, and, you know, this is this is a debate between um, in the field of economics right now. I mean, the, the the summer folks who think it is a little too much and are much more worried about inflation and, and are understandably worried about just giving money to people who perhaps don't need it. Um, mm -hmm. And those who say, look, we just need to stimulate the economy. We need to keep everyone afloat um, and let's let's not worry about this right now. Let's just inject a whole lot of money into the economy. And you know, I think it, there's a little bit of a generational divide there. The younger economists are a little less worried about this. And some of the more progressive economists like Paul Krugman are less worried about it. But it's not to say that Summers doesn't have a point. I just, I tend to think that the biggest danger is not doing enough right now. I see, yeah, I, I guess um, Summers might be, referring to a, a lost opportunity. In fact, I think that's what I did hear, read or hear him say that we're gonna look back on this and not uh, regret that it was done, that it is done is good, but that it wasn't done with enough purpose to, to get us uh, a leg up, you know, going forward. And he also was concerned about competition with the Chinese. I didn't quite understand where that came in. But anyhow, he was, he was um, well, I mean, all of this is quarterback stuff you know the day after um and so uh, where, where was all all of these recommendations during the the prep period and certainly um the the politics uh of it don't, don't get mentioned so much anymore we're just talking about it from what it is now and what it turned out to be without considering the gigantic pressure that was coming um to get something done and to have this use this opportunity as best could be done under the circumstances but I, I'm wondering about the um, the relief for some of the so here in Hawaii, for instance, um, between um, city, county, and state. And maybe I just don't understand this very well. But doesn't city, county, Mayor Blangiardi, doesn't he have to rely on the state to provide fundings where he may still have a shortfall? And is that is that lessened now? that he would have to work with Governor Ige um, to, to meet, meet budget needs. What, what do you think is the situation there? 
uh, between the county and the city and the state. Absolutely. I mean, some of this is all, I mean, that, like we said before, the $365 million is already targeted to local county government relief. This is for Honolulu County. Um, and so that money will come directly to the county. He doesn't have to go hat in hand to the governor to ask for it. Precisely how that happens, I can't answer. Um, but it will go to the county because this is earmarked for local government. Um, according to the formula that they've used based on population, that's why Honolulu gets what it gets. And some of this is due to the unemployment rate too. Um, so yeah, this is a big bailout for, for Mayor Blangiardi. I mean, there was the, the, the county, the city and county were hit very hard as a result of this. Um, and they don't have a lot of places they can go to increase taxes. The state can, and, and you saw these proposals on the ledge, now they've mainly been um, abandoned to raise ta income taxes on Hawaii's highest income earners. The ca city and county could go to property taxes, but here in Hawaii, that is a politically difficult thing to do because we have very low property taxes, but that's partially because the value of people's houses here is so high, even though their income isn't particularly high. And so raising property taxes in Hawaii is always a politically difficult thing to do because you could have someone who makes a relatively modest income, but whose family home is worth a million dollars. And so they're not in a position to pay those property taxes. And so that always puts the city and county in a tough spot. Um, because they can't, um, it's politically very difficult for them to raise property taxes. Yeah, well, I, I would think, uh, yeah, so this truly is a relief for Hawaii. And, um, and, and it's very, it seems likely that the tourists are still going to come back here. I mean, as you said, you know, we were doing what, 30,000 a day or something, we're getting off these planes and ships and and uh, transports, and uh, um, I think that um, the co this COVID relief also has a big hunk of money going to the airport to, right. to, to cover the COVID relief maintenance and operations and expenses that they, they've had, enormous expenses. And then, of course, they also have some going into heart. So would you say that maybe we're close to the Goldilocks zone here on, on getting it just right from, I think from the fence? I, I mean, I, I, I wonder if you see that as remarkable or not. I mean, how it is, they it get is it remarkable. right? I mean, let's, let's talk for a minute about how remarkable this is. I mean, this is uh, one of the largest expenditures ever made in the United States. Um, I mean, we're talking about World War II level spending. That's not something that has happened in the past. I mean, it is, um, and it's politically relatively uncontroversial. I mean, that is the other shocking thing. This is, public opinion is very much for this. Um, although it wasn't a bipartisan package, um, the, the it is largely supported by the public. The Republicans really haven't made much of it as a political talking point. They've sort of moved on to, the cultural politics things because this is so widely supported. So we are, we're very lucky. I mean, could there be problems with this, with inflation? Absolutely. Um, but this state in particular was hit very hard um, and um, was in desperate need of these funds. I honestly don't know what we would do with without this sort of bailout. There isn't an immediate solution. And we could benefit too from what the bill that might be on its heels, which is this proposed $2 trillion infrastructure investment. Now that would be targeted, um, that would be spread over a much longer period of time, but you mentioned um, improvements to the airport, I mean, and, and some money for heart, um, and we could be seeing more and more of that um, if this infrastructure bill is passed as well, which I think some form of it likely will be. Well, I, I guess I'm saying that um, it doesn't matter what I think, but it seems that the um, specifics of, of these funding um, gives um, are just what we need. I mean, and uh, certainly for something like heart, which is so oppressed and I just, it, it, is, it is remarkable. And then to have it be as big as it is. So to have Larry Summers come out and be, you know, so critical and he was on with who is that other um the other um major um economist who um has been so um so positive about this it's paul krugman and he's um just seen that this is uh, such a 
a, a big expansion that's so important and timely and something that you know we really need. So it was interesting to see the two of them together, one being so critical and the other being you know so positive and, and unresponsive to the, the 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 Larry Summers criticisms. Do they usually line up that way when they in in their economic policies and theory and now and policy analysis is that how they line up is Krugman being more uh, Krugman is more um, progressive what, for sure. um I mean he he definitely is more progressive I'm both and um Summers is a bit more conservative they're both Democrats I mean I would say that they're both on the progressive side of the economics profession although Summers is is more conservative than than Krugman for sure um, I mean, this this question about inflation is something no one really can answer. I mean, it's it's. I don't want to dismiss Summers' concerns because they're legitimate. Um, I mean, ten years ago, people would have said this is going to lead to huge inflationary pressure, but that didn't happen after the Great Recession. It didn't seem to have happened after the first stimulus package. So there's actually a theory called um, um, modern monetary theory that tries to understand why these running these big deficits don't seem to matter right now. But I think that overall, I mean, Krugman's position and a lot of economists' positions on the left is um, the worst thing we can do is provide enough money to just keep everyone on life, uh, life support, but not a huge injection of money to stimulate the economy and get things going again. And yes, there could be some inflation. Yes, there could be problems with this, but the cost of not doing um, the, the cost of doing too much is much greater than the cost of not doing enough. And I've been surprised at the relative consensus and support among most economists. I mean, that's why Summers has gotten a lot of attention is that he's one of the few who's really pushed back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm not sure what you can say anything briefly about this, but exact, most of us probably don't really understand how uh, inflation comes about. Is there any really quick way you can say something about how something like this could actually lead to inflation as it did after the Korean War or something like that? But what do you know? Is there a way to, to get a handle on that? Um, sure. I mean, inflation um, is always is, is, is can be a little mysterious and a little complicated. And actually, um, it but I'll say quickly, basically, the idea is if you create more money, then there's more money to spend, which can create upward pressure on the price of goods and on wages. Um, and then it can just lead to this, this spiral that increases the price of goods, which increases the price of wages, which lowers the value of money. Um, that can be really bad for people on fixed incomes or property. Um, but that hasn't happened. And so it, it is like a lot of things in economics, there's, there's a lot that's understood, but there are some things that are still a little bit mysterious. And I mean, the other thing that would increase inflation pressure is that um, the price for U.S. Treasury bonds go up, goes up the 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 uh, interest rate there, um, and that often is is what leads to it. But that hasn't happened either. Treasury bonds are still very very cheap, um, and so this is this is a real question in economics why this hasn't happened. But um, and it's really it's partially unique to the United States and a few other major economies. Okay, and that's why the interest rates can go up, and that's why we had such a difficult time in the 70s. Okay. All right. Well, I, I've uh, enjoyed the talk very much. I've learned a lot. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, sure. It's our low time, so I'll need to wrap it up. Um, and uh, I just say I, I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and this is the State of the State of Hawaii show. And we've been talking uh, remotely on Zoom, our favorite uh, method. Uh, with uh, Dr. Colin Moore uh, about the Federal CARES Act, the most recent uh, aid, relief aid that's coming to Hawaii and what is its impact on Hawaii. I'll see you in, in two weeks again um, on the next date of the state of Hawaii. So mahalo for your attention, everyone, and aloha. <laughs>